thank you so much for being here today. And um, wow, yeah, this is this is wild. So uh, my first time in a space like this, probably true for many of you as well. Um, and also, I just have to say those slides. So <laughs> thank you so much to the the climate gallery team. So I'm I'm actually on Safari, which um, I guess doesn't work so well so they're helping me out with the slides so that was that was my bad and uh thank you for getting that all sorted there everyone um all right uh my name is clara mache i am a visual painter or visual artist and painter and i i'm speaking to you today from fairbanks alaska and the lands of the lower tanana Diné. For those of you who are new in the AR space, I think I heard um, you sharing some tips and tricks, but uh, don't be afraid to use the little reactions. That is really helpful as a speaker. Um, so I appreciate that. And uh, I learned that you can like nod your head. This is like my favorite thing to do. So <laughs> you just have to move your mouse up and down to do that. Um, and then there's also the chat feature. So. In this space, the audio level is by proximity, but the stage I'm on right now actually projects my voice throughout the whole room. So if for some reason you can't hear me or I start to cut out, uh, please just let me or Logan or any one of the folks with the Climate Gallery know, or you can just pop into the chat. Um, otherwise, I'm going to assume you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, a, a huge thanks to everyone with the Climate Gallery, Logan, Siobhan, Mira, Rena, they've just been working so hard to design this space, organize all of this, put together the exhibit and all these associated events, um, virtual and in person. And um, I just really appreciate all their effort. Uh, their mission was to bring a diverse group of artists together to talk about climate change. And I think the galleries really speak to this goal. It's really, really awesome. I'm excited for you to see um, all the different galleries from all five artists. Uh, and I'm so impressed by the three dimensional and like interactive qualities and in all the other galleries. I'm a two dimensional artist. So I just, uh, I'm just totally astonished by what, what these other artists have done. So I hope you'll, you'll check them all out. Um, and you can do that with your ticket today, but also after Rose's presentation tomorrow, all these galleries will be free and open to the public. So you can visit them anytime. You can invite a friend for a visit. You can use them as a virtual hangout. It's so cool that they've designed this space to be open access in that way um, after that, that fifth talk is done. So um, super cool. Yeah, and uh, as Mira mentioned in her talk a couple, couple days ago, uh, we're all just such different artists and we all have something unique and important to share. And I think that's true for everyone here. Uh, we need many different skills. We need creative thinkers, we need organizers and just people working from their own experiences and backgrounds to address the climate crisis. So thank you for being here and being part of this conversation. Uh, I guess I should jump into the fun part of things. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so today I am going to share about the work that is in my section of the climate gallery, but I don't want to just show you a copy of um, everything that's in there that you're going to get to explore on your own. So I'm going to focus on talking about the process and the concepts behind the paintings. And this is kind of a primer for what you're going to find in the gallery later. Um, first, I'll do a short introduction and provide some context. And then I will talk about the process of painting outside on location. And uh, then I will share some ways in which art, my art is informed by science. Um, again, my name is Clara, and this is what I most commonly look like. Uh, so just like all of you, there is a real human behind this avatar. Uh, I usually wear contacts, but I totally wear these glasses if I could find them in real life. So um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a visual artist, and I specialize in painting outside, on location, in remote areas throughout Alaska. And Basically, what that means is I hike and ski uh, into these remote places with all of my camping gear, all of my art supplies, so that I can go paint directly in the places that I'm so inspired by. And in this case, that's glaciers and mountains. Um, go to the next slide. 
So uh, I want to provide a little bit of context about where um, where I'm speaking from, and um, I want to start by giving some sort of perspective on the Arctic. On the left is a circumpolar view of the Arctic, and you can see Alaska is in blue at the bottom there. I live uh, just about three hour drive south from the Arctic Circle. I'm in Fairbanks, which is right in the middle of the state of, of Alaska. And the Arctic is a really diverse um, region with many different species of birds, plants, animals, insects, all kinds of different organisms, and is probably characterized best by a region of extreme cold. Um, that being said, Alaska in particular is warming three times faster than the rest of the world. Uh, vanishing sea ice, permafrost thaw, and massive shifts in weather and very extreme weather events that are tied to climate change are happening in Alaska, as well as obviously all across the globe. Melting ice is one of the most dramatic and well-known changes, and 95% of the glaciers in Alaska are retreating or disappearing. So I wanted to focus on glaciers for this exhibit because they are something that a lot of people are curious about or have heard about, and that's regardless of their geography. Um, so I want to point out on the right side here that Alaska is a very big place with very few roads. Um, all the roads are in red here, and some of these are actually still dirt roads. They're not all paved highways. The three yellow triangles, they might be kind of hard to see, but the three yellow triangles point to the areas where I created the paintings that are in the gallery. Um, so how do I get to these remote places that are not on the road system so that I can go out there and paint? And you can go to the next slide. I am able to travel to these remote places through a variety of different approaches. Um, so I most often will first travel by road and then I will uh, commonly ski, float, or hike into the place that I want to paint. Um, and occasionally, there, because there are not many roads, there's a very uh, robust um, air or, or bush plane uh, community in Alaska. And occasionally, I'm lucky enough to have the opportunity to fly into a remote place, although this is very cost prohibitive um, and not always possible, but maybe, maybe once a year if I'm lucky. <laughs> um, sometimes I go on day trips. But more often, I spend about two to four nights out. And every year, I'll go on at least uh, maybe like three or four extended trips where I might be painting on location for about 12 or 16 days at a time. Um, go to the next slide. I uh, So when I'm painting outside, I well, actually all the time, even in the studio, I use oil paints. Um, and I use an alkyd dryer or a walnut oil as a medium. And basically what that means if you're not a painter is that this medium, it helps dry the paint faster so that instead of waiting for days or weeks or months, I can um, actually have the painting be dry enough in a matter of hours or possibly even a day or two so that I can therefore roll it up and pack it out. Um, so that's, that's a, key, a key ingredient <laughs> in my practice. And one neat thing about fitting everything you need into a backpack is that you really have to carefully consider its weight, its purpose. I have to justify every single item that I'm carrying on my back, right? Um, I'm not that strong. I don't want a hundred pound pack. So I really have to think through what I'm bringing out. And, uh, and on that note, I, I also practice leave no trace. So anything that I bring in, including like the tiny little staples that I use to create the painting, um, I bring back out. So um, I practice leave no trace there. I'm seeing, oh, yay, okay. I just pulled up the chat. So many things happening. Um, yay, leave no trace, that's right. Oh, losing volume. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay, good. Yes. Awesome, okay, great. Um, one funny thing, uh, the furthest right image on this slide, <laughs> one funny thing I learned early on was to carry my paint in a water, uh, like a watertight uh, roll top dry bag. 
because I had a tube of uh, blue paint explode all over my backpack, inside my backpack and all over my gear one year. Um, and you can't see it in the photo, but that green jacket on the floor there still has some of that blue paint on it, even like eight or nine years later. So um, all of this is just a fun part of the process and figuring out how to, um, how to go about all of this. So you can go to the next slide. So this is one of the most common questions I get. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about it. Uh, oil paints don't freeze, but they do get stiff in colder temperatures. So I keep uh, the paint inside my jacket. And the best way to stay warm and how I stay warm is to um, just constantly move and constantly eat food. So I have no problem with that. Um, I love it. Get to eat a ton of food all the time. And there are also other little tricks, like I have two insulated pads, those gray squares in the middle photo there that I will sit, stand, sleep on. And it just adds another layer between myself and all the snow and ice. So these are just little tricks that I use to, to stay warm while I'm painting on location. And um, painting outside is actually a very active process. So uh, if I do start to get cold, and usually it's my hands or my toes, I'll often just like uh, do a little dance or I'll go for a quick ski. And yeah, I just kind of have to keep my, my blood flowing because I'm working for about, you know, anywhere from six to 12 hours at a time on, on a single painting. Um, so staying warm is a skill. It's something you learn. Uh, and once you, once you learn it, it's not so hard. And, and this is how I'm able to do these things. Um, also having a really good tent helps. So <laughs> uh, I invested in a good tent very early on and, and that helps keep me warm. So um, we can go to the next slide. So this uh, painting is from a few years ago and is not actually included in the exhibit, but it shows what a snow studio looks like. And you can see the finished painting on the right. The wood frame collapses down into four pieces and the canvas is rolled up um, to, so that it, I can transport it to and from the location. Um, and I think what I wanted to share about this is that painting on location is a very immersive experience. Um, I'm realizing how much I talk with my hands and you can't see me talking with my hands. It's great. I'm waving my hands all over the place right now. Um, it allows me to see and, uh, you know, really listen to the land. And I'm constantly, it's this very direct response to my surroundings. And, and through that, I'm trying to capture a sense of flow through the lines and the brushstrokes on the canvas. And glaciers especially are very dynamic places. Um, over the last century, the rate of change and the rate of the dynamics in these places has really increased dramatically. And this is where art and science can help tell the story of how glaciers are changing in response to a rapidly warming world. So let's go to the next slide and talk about art and science a bit before we dive into it. So. I'm hearing noises. Did I just do something? Nope, I'm you're good. Here. Okay, <laughs> thanks everyone. You're awesome. This is this is great. I, I love all the emojis. It's, this is a <laughs> this is quite a new experience. So, thanks for uh, thanks for being here. Um, so, science and art are really actually very similar ways of knowing. Um, it's science and art are both rooted in curiosity. They both depend on keen observations. Um, and both science and art rely on inquiry and experimentation. Um, all those things are true. The outdoors ground us, science gives us important information, and I think art reminds us of what's at stake. So on the left is a diagram uh, from a paper by Fred Chambers and others. I understand about 20% of the information in this article. And to be clear, this is literature written by scientists for other scientists, but it's super rich and really interesting material. And reading scientific papers has become a really important part of my process um, because of this reason. So on the right, you can see a beautiful diagram illustrating various features of the Gulcana Glacier. Uh, this is from a different research paper, but looking at these different papers and talking with glaciologists has become a really important part of how I understand and visually represent gl 
glaciers. So I want to be clear, like my my artwork is not trying to illustrate science. It's not trying to illustrate a specific scientific concept or, you know, show what the research is saying, but it's rooted in this really deep scientific understanding. Um, so I hope that makes sense. I think that's an important distinction. Um, let's go to the next slide. So the theme of this exhibit uh, for, for everyone involved is artivism. So I just want to talk briefly about how art can play a role in our response to the climate crisis. Uh, images are powerful and artists are experts in visual communication. We create culture by translating complex ideas, emotions, and stories. So through my work about glaciers, I'm trying to document change to bring remote places into this very conversation that we're having and provide a unique perspective to help all different people connect with these remote places. Um, when, when people can connect deeply with a place, they're more likely to care about it. And this is, this is a little out there. I have to say, I'm gonna try and, and kind of talk about it. This is stuff that I'm still really trying to figure out and think through in my practice. So um, hopefully, it, hopefully it makes sense. But, um, you know, climate change is so complex. And, and sometimes I wonder why I make art about climate change? Why make art about remote places when we are seeing very real life things, um, you know, that are a function of the climate crisis, like flooding, fires, we're seeing people being displaced, um, sea level rise, drought. I mean, really big issues happening that are right there in our faces. Um, but I think it's important to also still talk about the many processes that are actually causing these events. Um, and those, those processes are ongoing at all times, even when those events aren't happening. And they might be happening long before the actual event itself. And so, for example, like we can't see temperature, but we can see ice melting. So this is why art is really important to communicate about these intangible processes and give us some kind of framework so that we can actually talk about them and like understand them in some sense. Um, and not just through science, but through art as well. So hopefully that's not too out there, but I think that's one of the one of the key things that art can bring to to these really important discussions about climate. Um, all right, let's dive into the actual work. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, you can go to the next slide. Perfect, thank you. Um, so in the gallery, you're going to find uh, recent artwork from three, three glaciers in Alaska, as I mentioned before. And I have focused on these glaciers through three concepts, scale, time, and immersion. Scale can be tricky to understand. Uh, we humans are very small and the world is a very big place. Um, I can't think of a more complex issue than the climate crisis. Um, so scale is really important and trying to figure out a way to interact with it is, is part of what I'm trying to do through, through my art. This is an image of the Bagley Glacier. Uh, the glacier is actually the big flat area out in front of the mountains, uh, the big white flat expanse. It's uh, covered in a thick blanket of snow, so you can actually see the ice. It's just the snow on top of the ice. And from where I took this photo, the mountains are about six miles away. But given that big expanse of white, of white, it almost feels like you can reach out and touch them. Even in person, it didn't feel like those mountains were that far away. So um, let's go to the next slide. Glacial recession in remote out mountain areas, uh, particularly on the Bagley Glacier, are increasingly studied through satellite imagery, through remote sensing, through people flying in planes or using drones, so looking at the glacier from the air. Uh, one of the reasons that I think it's important to think about scale is that we need this perspective from being on the ground as well. We need those direct emotive experiences with place. So looking at the world through the scale of a satellite or drone is very helpful, but we also need those ground, we need to ground truth those perspectives. Um, and that's, that's what allows us to feel emotionally attached to these places. Painters also have to think about scale when they compose an image, which was a very daunting task on the Bagley. 
um, I decided to focus on a small area of the mountains so that I could emphasize the cracked ice falling away from the rock and make that the main feature of this painting. Um, and you can see the, the snow studio here. This painting took about three days to finish. And um, let's see, what else do I wanna share about this? I guess, honestly, I landed in this place and I was so overwhelmed by the scale of it that for this first painting, I really was just like, okay, my one goal is to figure out, like, I just need to get a better sense of the size of this place. And so um, that's our base camp, camp in the background there. And yeah, it was, it was daunting. I, I'm not really sure what else to say about that. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, let's go to the next slide. Scale is tricky. I think that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> So this is the second painting I made on the Bagley, and it's called Glacier Bones. Uh, the rocks here are protruding upwards from the surrounding snow-covered ice. And, um, and I think the idea here was to kind of talk about how the bones of the glacier, or like the bones of this landscape, are kind of sticking up through the ice. So it's very possible that hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, tens of thousands of years ago, the ice actually covered these rocks and so that's where the that's where the name comes from so it's it's the glacier's bones poking out through the landscape and um despite its massive size the bagley glacier is still impacted by climate change this huge landscape um you know is experiencing changes in precipitation temperatures and shifts in seasonal weather patterns and it's it's getting smaller so uh, let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about the, the work in progress. So this, I think this shows a little better um, what the underpainting looks like. So this is the same painting as the previous slide. And it's kind of like the raw, um, almost like the sketch first, right? And it, and it shows how I, I am trying to feel out or find a visual language of change over time. The lines are inferring movement and flow of the snow and ice. And you can even see the first impressions of um, clouds or, or, well, actually of, of a storm to come. <laughs> I worked on this painting and um, had to take a day and a half break because we actually, I couldn't see the mountain uh, for about a day and a half because it was a big snowstorm. So you can kind of get a sense of, of that coming. And, uh, and yeah, I guess, you, I wanted to share this too, because I think it shows how I'm trying to cope with scale, how I'm trying to figure out the relationships of the rocks to the ice and the shapes and the forms and trying to understand this place. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Thank you, Siobhan, you're so awesome. I really appreciate you. Um, so these are, this is like a series of small 12 inch studies. So when I can't see the mountains, I often will have uh, little sketches handy that I, that I do when I can see the mountains and I'll come back and I'll fill them in with paint when I can't see anything else. And, you know, just on the, on the idea of scale, it's really helpful. The paintings I'm making are quite large. These are about 12 inches um, tall. So they're much smaller. And it's a really useful way to zoom in and zoom out and really examine this very complex landscape from like all these different perspectives. And they also act as a record of weather on different days. So um, yeah, and we were, I guess it, sh it would be good to mention we were out there for 14 days. I was um, able to visit the Bagley with another artist, Bill Brody. And I think it's also worth noting that the last day we were there was the hottest I've ever been on the glacier. And looking back at the records, um, once I got home, I could see that, you know, this was just one one experience, one day, but it's uh, an example of a trend over time that these places are getting warmer. Um, so that's the importance of these firsthand experiences in these places. All right, I don't wanna keep talking for too long. Let's go next to the next slide. I could talk about this stuff for hours. So um, I'm gonna try not to, I want you to go have a chance to explore the gallery, so. <laughs> Um, the Golcana Glacier is going to be the center gallery when you when you get into the virtual space. Um, this place has helped me process grief, um, cultivate resiliency, and grow as a ski mountaineer. It's a very important place to me. And 
Along the way, it's become my personal landmark for measuring climate change. You can go to the next slide. We're gonna have some, some quick slides here. So as someone who has re repeatedly visited this place, I can see that change is happening here using a, a variety of different landmarks. So this, um, this rock outcropping that you see here is kind of like my, the main landmark that I've been focused on. So on the left is an archival photo from the 70s um, from the University of Alaska Anchorage Archives. And on the right is a photo I took while instructing for Inspiring Girls Expeditions, which is a super cool program that I'll talk a little bit more about later. And basically the takeaway here is that I see more rock and less ice every time I visit this place. So um, go to the next slide. We're gonna go through, this is a very non-scientific way of approaching this. So take this with a grain of salt, but, the, but I, I think the change is obvious enough. So the photos are not from the exact same perspective, but the circles in red show the same general area and how it's changed in 40 years. So I'm, I'm 35, I think. I'm really bad with numbers. So basically in my lifetime, more or less, plus or minus five years. <laughs> um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. So the arrows here um, on the left, it's just, I wanted to point out that that's, uh, that's the ice fall there. And the arrow on the right shows how little ice remains. Um, this is actually a three-year-old photo now. So um, on the right side. So basically what I want you to take away is that you don't have to be a scientist to know that this place is changing. <laughs> so uh, let's go to the next slide. Three years ago, I decided I wanted to paint this rock outcropping over a 10 year time span. So um, the idea was kind of rooted in scientific thinking. I was gonna go out every September. I guess I should also point out, this is from a very different, another perspective on that same rock, but it's still that same rock. Hopefully hopefully that's obvious, but um, yeah, I. I wanted to go paint in September because that's when scientists who are studying this glacier will take their seasonal um, measurements to kind of, they take what's called a mass balance measurement. And that's basically just a measurement of the health of the glacier. Did it melt more or did it grow? And if you go to the next slide, the data says that the, or the science says that the Gulkana has been steadily, very steadily shrinking uh, over the last 56 years that they've been measuring it. Um, so the photos show that, uh, my experiences there show that, and the data shows that. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So this painting is actually just from a few weeks ago. It was my third year returning to that same place um, to paint at the same time of the year. And the whole idea here is that I'm just trying to show the visuals of change over time. And um, this year, I'm actually really lucky. I just got a, a project funded to go paint the Gulkana Glacier a few more times within a year. And so um, my goal is to add additional landmarks to this whole series. So not just this rock, but you know, areas of the upper glacier as well. And um, oh, one really cool thing about that is I'm going to be working with some glaciologists and archival photos to actually start painting backwards in time and hopefully forwards in time. So, um, you know, what does the potential future of this place look like? That's something art can do. You can't go forward in time. You can't like jump on a, you know, a time travel machine and go find out what it's gonna look like. But art can do that. That's one of the really powerful things about art. So I'm really looking forward to that. That's something I'm actively working on. So um, yeah, let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. So at this stage in the project, these are the all three paintings from 2020 through uh, 2022. Um, and I, I just want to point out that, uh, you know, these, how, how to say, so climate is something that happens over many, many years. Um, I think that these paintings right now say more about seasonal variability and the weather that I was experiencing each year than they do about climate. Um, but that's the whole idea about returning for a whole decade over 10 years. I'm really curious to find out how is that 10th painting going to compare to the first painting? Um, is it going to show the story of climate change? And 
you know, I originally estimated that the ice fall on the left there might be gone within a decade, and I'm starting to see that I'm probably wrong, but uh, I don't know. This is, this is part of why we ask these questions and why I'm going back year after year to, um, to find out. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a good exercise in, in having empathy for this place and, um, and thinking about time and how to show change over time. We can go to the next slide. All right, so this is the uh, third wing of the gallery that you're gonna be able to go into and experience. And it focuses on immersion and specifically immersion um, in the Hanwell Glacier, um, which is in the Alaska range. It's, I, thank you for all the comments. I'm reading them as we're going and this is, this is great. Um, thank you. <laughs> so, painting inside ice caves. All right, how did this start? So, this was really an effort to say something or to, to translate something about uh, glaciers that's a little bit more intimate and immersive. Like, there's no longer a horizon line. The viewer is now within the ice cave. And, um, yeah, it was just a it was just a way to celebrate these really beautiful places too. I mean, glacier glacier ice is really incredible. Um, it forms over like many many years. Um, it's basically snow. Oh my gosh! You have to come back tomorrow and see Rose's presentation. Uh, Rose is one of the artists, and she just has a phenomenal phenomenal cake that explains how a glacier uh, is created through snow falling compressing into ice layers and she's got some awesome artwork about that so be sure to come back tomorrow um i'm not even going to try to explain it because she does it so well but basically glacier ice is gorgeous that's all you need to know um <laughs> and so this was you know i think it has this really universal appeal appeal and and so i wanted to capture that in a painting we have a very similar emotional experience to glacier ice everyone looks at it and they're like oh my gosh that's incredible um, and, and on the other hand too, I was noticing at the same time that these easily accessible ice caves all over the state of Alaska are seeing this really big influx of visitors. And I think that just reinforces that people are really interested in these places. And so art is a way to, um, visually reaffirm these shared emotional reactions or experiences of these places. So, um, you know, stepping into an ice cave is is magical. And um, yeah, let's go to the next slide. I can go on and on, on and on about ice caves. So here you can see my uh, partner James skiing into a tunnel of glacial ice. He is awesome and like the invisible person behind a lot of these trips. He helps support, um, support my efforts in a big way. So thank you, James. Um, and on the right is the frame and the rolled canvas for the painting. So you can kind of see what what it actually what the paintings actually look like when they're being transported it's pretty simple um i can just strap them to the side of my backpack uh yeah the next slide just about done here so um oh i know what i wanted to say this project was really i have to give a huge credit to um a microbiologist mary beth lee she's from the university of alaska fairbanks and this is actually a really great concept to end on. So she introduced me to this concept of, or this idea of a boundary object. So a boundary object is an idea, a place, an object, or anything that people from vastly different backgrounds, identities, or cultures can agree is important. And I'm fascinated by the idea that people visit ice caves because we universally agree they are beautiful. And, you know, this, this series of paintings it focuses on that. It, it shows these colors, these textures, these forms, and it celebrates this common ground. And I think that that's a really powerful um, idea that beauty can actually act as a foothold into caring more about these places. Um, yeah, and this this was a very fast painting. This was a painting I, I actually started on location in one day and then later finished in the studio. So um, this is also an ongoing body of work and hopefully painting in some more ice caves this winter. So um, more to come, yeah. Uh, all right, let's go to the last slide. 
or maybe it's the second to last slide. Oh, that's the ice cave. That's the painting. <laughs> so this is a, this is a preview of what you'll see in the gallery. Um, so I just wanted to, to share at least one full painting with you here. And uh, yeah, I, I, I guess, let me wrap up this way. So I hope this work really acts as a window into places you might not otherwise get to see or experience. Um, we are all connected through climate and we need to listen to the land and we need to listen to each other if we're gonna figure this thing out. So um, yeah, these are, so I, I'll point out the resources. I actually, I, I feel like I talked a little long, but uh, these are some really great resources. These are folks that I work directly with. Um, kind of says it all there on the slide, but uh, I just got to say Inspiring Girls Expeditions offers these trips for young women um, or folks who identify as women uh, all over the world now, actually. So uh, the applications for it are open in December. And if you know a young woman, uh, I think it's ages 16 to 18, who might want to go learn about art and science on a glacier or learn about rock climbing or learn about sea kayaking, and just connect with place. It's a tuition free program. Uh, it's, I can't say enough good things about it. Uh, so, so I encourage you to think about folks in your life who you could share this opportunity with and yeah, applications are going to be open in the next, uh, next four weeks or so. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, I think we can go to the last slide and I'll just say thank you again. And um, Siobhan made a great point. The direct links are all right there on the wall to the right of the talk. They're also in the gallery. And if you have any questions about any of those resources, I'm happy to talk more, but I, I want to let you go. I've been, I've been talking long enough. And uh, yeah, thanks, Mira, for uh, going through the slides for me. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to, happy to talk or you can go explore the gallery. I forgot to I move. Forgot. I was supposed to move, so I look like I'm talking. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I think there was one question about mixing paints. Do you actually mix the paints um, like on the canvas, or how do you do that? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, um, I do a little bit of both. So I carry a very limited palette. Um, so I only sometimes will only bring three or four tubes of paint out because it's actually quite heavy. Um, and I will either mix them right in. I bring a little uh, reusable Tupperware is what I actually use as a palette. So I sometimes mix them right on the palette. And um, Sometimes I mix them right on the canvas as well. Sometimes there's a bit of like intuitive uh, color mixing that happens. Um, so a little bit of both. I hope that answers that question. If anyone wants to talk more about it, I'm, I'm happy to share. Oh, right. The purple portal. Purple portal. Ooh, say that five times fast. That's where you can go, uh, go see the artwork. Looks like another question in chat about how you started making work like this and what your creative process is to get into this point. Yeah. Um, gosh. Oh, I think I, I felt like I was talking too much, so I don't want to talk too much about that. But uh, so I kind of skipped over that part. Um, it was a long process. I think that, you know, I actually really wanted to study science and I found that art was a much more natural way for me to um, be curious about the things that I was curious about and to, to work these ideas out. Um, so I just, I've always made art. I've been very lucky to have parents who've been supportive of that. And uh, I took a class, I think maybe 14 years ago to learn how to paint outside. And it just really sparked something for me. Um, I was like, oh, this is what I'm meant to be doing. Uh, I need to do more of this. And so since then, I've just been really focused on, you know, developing the skills, both the outdoor skills and also the artistic skills to, to be able to go do this. Um, also, is that, is that, is your name Michelle M. M. Bruton? I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think we just met on Instagram and it's so cool that you're here. 
Oh, Sarah has just asked, how do you get your art out there so the message is received? Megan, Megan, not Michelle. I'm sorry, Megan. <laughs> um, Sarah, that's a really good question. When you find the answer, please let me know. Um, so <laughs> I think actually one of the really cool things about the Climate Gallery and what made me really interested in applying for this opportunity was that it removes these geographic boundaries, right? Like I live in Alaska. I live in actually a pretty rural place of, of Alaska. And it's very hard. I've lived here my whole life. It's very hard to um, sort of connect with the larger art world and, and share this work. And so I, I'm really grateful to the Climate Gallery for helping me get this out there. Um, I think Instagram probably plays a role too in, in sharing the work, but that's, as you probably all know, kind of a complicated, uh, you know, beast of its own. And I, I uh, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to get it out there, but I hope to get it out there. That's something I'm working on. Hopefully that wasn't too long of an answer. <laughs> um, and Mira asks, uh, what, do, what do you do if the oil paint accidentally gets stiff when it's not supposed to? Do you improvise or start over? And um, pretty much improvise is, is the name of the game. And so if, the, if, for example, the oil paint gets too stiff on the canvas, um, mm, that's a good question. What do I do? Usually, usually it's even, so I've painted as cold as 30 below Fahrenheit. And even at that cold temperature and, and the paint is very stiff, it will eventually dry. Um, and so I'm, I'm able to work over it again. Or you can scrape it off with a palette knife. So I carry a Leatherman with me and I can kind of scrape off the, off the paint. Um, so, so yeah, imp improvise, I would say is the answer there. <laughs> And uh, do you have galleries or do you print and sell that way? Um, I don't have a gallery. I have the climate gallery. Um, I, I have shown in galleries within the state of Alaska. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't create prints of my artwork. Um, I actually studied as a printmaker and would like to get back into printmaking. And I, I feel... Um, on some level that uh, the paintings speak for themselves. And when I digitally reproduce them, it, it sort of loses something. And I, I feel like I sound like I have a stick up my butt or something when I'm saying this out loud. But um, yeah, I just, I also uh, struggle with managing the business side of things, um, you know, in terms of, of print sales and stuff. I really admire folks who can, who can crack that nut and, and make it work for them, but I'm just not, not one of those folks. So yeah that was that was my that was my brutally honest answer <laughs> might be time to go wander the gallery eh? Uh -oh. I can hear you Oh, good. I think I'm figuring out how to see the paintings. They're absolutely fantastic. Yay, oh, I'm so glad. And every movement-wise, everything okay? Anything I can help with? Um, no, I'm pretty old with an old computer. I've been struggling. But now that I'm in the gallery room and I'm figuring out how to rotate around and achieve things, I'm pretty happy. Yay, awesome. I will leave you to it. <laughs> and are you the artist? I uh, no, I'm I'm the VR designer. So I okay. built this gallery with Clara to display her work in. Yeah, I, I've tried to deal with these kinds of virtual galleries before. Um, one that we tried to create for a show here in Portland during the COVID and they're they're pretty hard to navigate, um, if you're not real techy, but I'm figuring it out and uh, I need to know more about this because this is the way of the future. I unfortunately thinking that we need. Oh gosh, especially since the pandemic, it has been a, a huge learning curve for me particularly figuring out how to, to build them and get the galleries set up and then learn how to navigate within them. Um, but any, we are super excited about this project and would love to help anyone else looking to do virtual galleries, so please reach out to us on our website, email, Instagram, we would love to help. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I'm checking you out. I'm very interested in this. Like I said in my little thing I wrote to join this uh, event, was that I've been doing this kind of work for 40 years and trying to figure out how to move into the future and make it effective and how to reach out in today's world. And this is really important. And maybe at some point I'll have some fresh work to share with you. And you really enjoy it. Amazing. I'm excited to see it. All right. Take care. Thanks for checking yeah. in. Of course, no worries. Enjoy the gallery. Thank you. Clara! Hey, your talk hi. was amazing! Oh, thank you. <laughs> that was uh, so beautiful. That was good. Yeah. Oh, thank you yay. for all your help getting the slides to work in the beginning. Oh, of course. Mira, Mira, of course, coming in clutch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. She's on it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you seem so cool to hear like about your process in more detail. I you know, I've I've been looking at your work for so long. It's cool to kind of have a step back and see how you process. Yeah, that's awesome. I hope I hope it like enhances the work, you know. I was like, Oh, I don't wanna give too much away and I thought Mira did a great job of doing that with her talk and and uh yeah, yeah. Hope it was <laughs> you know, it's funny, like uh I feel like uh what am I trying to say? Public speaking is a little scary. This was a little less, a little less anxiety inducing, but uh, it's so good to practice talking about it and like thinking out loud and oh my gosh, yeah, yes. being, <laughs> being able to have a conversation about it. So yeah, yeah. yay! Oh, I'm so glad. I know I, I hate public speaking, but it feels a little <laughs> easier when I can pretend that I just moved here and nobody was talking to me. Right, right, totally. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, I have to tell you, the snow looks so good, too. It's still, like, my favorite part of the gallery. Like, uh, yeah, Yay. Seeing, seeing it come to life. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, I love the particle effects that you can do with it. It's so fun. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you step out and you're looking over the snow with snow, like, falling down. It's like, ooh, this is great. Totally. <laughs> totally. Yay. Such a good idea. That was all you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a joint effort. <laughs> Yay. I've got your seven second clip playing up for people to look at, and then I've also loaded in my screen with your full video because that's loading in a little bit better. Oh, um, and that's over awesome. on the balcony, so everything oh. is in at the moment. Oh, that's so cool to hear. I meant to actually mention that in the talk. Um, I'm glad, well, you're on it. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> oh, hi, Rena. Glad you made it. Hey. Yay. I love your glasses. Hi, Rena. Your fluffy little oh. virtual reality event. <laughs> Say again? I love your glasses. Your earrings oh, glasses. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you are well fly. Hey Jess. Hey. Oh, um, last last of your painting, especially that oil canvas. I really love it. And then I do need to see Hi. if that one is uh, in person. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm still seeing more stuff. Thank you. And I don't know, is there a time limit on this? Uh, no, no, there's no time limit. Mm -hmm. Oh, good, I'm glad you're checking things out. Yeah, I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't really have control, but I'm getting places I'm seeing cool stuff. Oh, good, that's all that matters. Does anyone have like a it's not but uh, can you hear me? Someone has a it's not the condition or solicitation like me on the other day. Yeah. Is it okay? Hey Ian. What up? Not sure if it is it, but now it stops that that sound, so it's gonna be really good. Yeah. You turned around. Mm. Hello. Hi. Good to see you again. I 
Hello, Mia. How's it going? Good. Yay! I feel <laughs> I feel a little <laughs> um I <laughs> well, <laughs> not what should I say? <laughs> like <laughs> you know, pe people who are who are joining again. through phone seems to be having the hardest Hello? time. <laughs> Hi. I, uh, I feel I feel bad about that. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I wish, feel like yeah, I wish you know those videos of cats looking at lights and they like can't figure out where they're coming from. Well, it's, it's, it's hard though because the phone screen. Is that was a great talk. I'm so glad I caught it. Oh, me too. I'm really honored you came. Thank you. From an Android yeah. phone, yeah. which is I, I hope it wasn't iPhone, uh, like the, well, yeah, the UI it is sense. just very different. Yeah, so it's probably easy. It's not always easy. Yeah, it was hard to give like helpful directions. The talk was very good, and then figuring out how to. Exactly. Things exactly. Very entertaining. That's something that I really right. It was right. It's just something to <laughs> worry. Yes. Yes. I think this is a very new experience for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gathering like a bunch so of post-it post right? post right? notes on my picture. They are. Yes. So what what are you doing? What have you been doing? Yeah. I mean, it's been honestly seems to be going pretty smoothly. I have to say, like ten years since I went to school. Like a lot um, of these organic triaging and like down. Um, a bit of silk so screen. Proud. Back no. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of etching. You don't have to ask that's around that's and stuff like that. We're just right? doing it Mad. automatically. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I feel the same way about screen I don't possess that brain. I want to throw an emoji, but I don't have any. You know, I don't think I can do it. Yeah, can you can you hear me? Oh yeah, you can have my emoji. Oh, hello. Everyone. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you just throw the heart. You just throw your heart. I love hearing all the giggles in the background. <laughs> it's pretty cute. It's like a very reactive life. I think. Yeah, I think it uh, gives me a little bit more.